looking for like Freya centric glamour magic, but it's also giving Stevie Nicks. What's up, witches? You may be asking yourself why I'm all glammed up today. I want to do an entire three part series all about Freya and specifically Freya and Brisingamen because along with Freya and cats, one of the few things that we know about Freya from the poetic myths and eddas of the Norse is that she is the wearer of Brisingamen. And so this led me, of course, as I am wont to do, to go on an entire rabbit hole mythological deep dive in order to figure out what is Brisingamen? How did Freya come to possess it? And what might its deeper meanings be? In this first part, I'm going to talk about the basics of what we know of Freya and Brisingamen from the Eddas and the story of how she came to get it that is found in the sagas. So this will just be kind of our baseline, our jumping off point to further explore this concept. So let's get into it. So, what do we know about Brisingamen from the sagas? Well, if we look at the first part, Brising, it could possibly be derived from words that mean things like fire or fiery, brilliant, and might even denote the brilliance or fiery gleam of amber, which Freya is also associated with. She's described as crying tears of amber or gold, which may be part of why nowadays we seem to associate not just Freya with amber, but also her necklace, Brisingamen, with amber, and depict it as being made of amber or amber and gold. You'll see a lot of artifacts of carved amber being traded around you. Europe that were sourced from the Baltic region, and we know that amber was very popular in those northern Baltic and like Frisian areas where Vanir or Vanir-like worship seems to be prevalent. But another possible meaning for Brising could be as a specific noun denoting a people's named or a tribe named the Brisings. And the word men means a necklace or an enclosure, or possibly also a torque. Now, to find the historical Norse story for how Freya came to own Brisinga men, we have to go to something called the saga of Olaf Tryggvason, as found in the Flati Jarbok, a later manuscript which was written in the 1300s by Christian monks. So I think that's very important to note that this is the lens in which this was being looked at, examined, and copied down. So we all know how these Christians and their morals and mores came to influence a lot of these later writings and oral traditions and stories once they were finally copied down. And I think we can definitely see that influencing this story in particular. Since since Freya was a goddess of love, fertility, and sexuality. So our story starts out by saying that Freya was a human in Asia. So we're already trying to euhemerize them and eliminate this view of them as divine beings like Snorri tries to do in the prose eddas by saying that these were not gods, these were not divine beings, they were just human beings who lived on planet earth just like us and were just later deified and through their heroic deeds and their fame came to be looked at as gods. So it says that Freya was a human in Asia and was the favorite concubine of Odin, which just, ew, no, I definitely do not think, and this is just my own personal opinion and UPG here, so do not come for me, but I do not think that Freya could be delineated as merely Odin's concubine. This is, after all, the goddess of love and beauty, a queen, if you will, among the Vanir, who even once she came to live amongst the Aesir was still given the title of High Priestess, was in fact the one who taught Odin everything he knows 
about Seder magic. Do I think they may have possibly been friends with benefits or even something more? Perhaps. We do know that Odin liked to get around and as Loki alluded to in Lokasena, so did Freya and most of the other gods. I like to joke that if anything, she's Odin's work wife. Not only was Freya, according to this story, just a human living in Asia, but was the favorite concubine of Odin, king of Asia land. And I don't know why they like to say this, other than as I theorized in one of my other videos, that just the Homeric epics and hymns were like kind of the end all be all of storytelling at the time. So everyone wanted to be the next Homer and trace their history and their people's history back to famous things and famous historical figures from Greece and Troy and all of that. Or maybe they just thought that Aesir sounded like Asia. It goes on to say that when this woman wanted to buy a golden necklace forged by four dwarves named Dvalin, Alfric, Berling, and Grer, she offered them gold and silver, but they replied that they would only sell it to her if she would lie a night with each of them. Doesn't really go into further detail as to what that means, but we can probably guess what they really mean by lie a night with each of them. She came home afterwards with the necklace and kept silent as if nothing had happened. But Loki somehow knew it, as of course he does, and came to tell Odin. Odin commanded Loki to steal the necklace, so Loki turned into a fly to sneak into Freya's bower and stole it. When Freya found her necklace missing, she came to ask King Odin. In exchange for it, Odin ordered her to make two kings, each served by twenty kings, fight forever. Unless, and this is probably a major later self-insert here by the part of the monk, unless some christened men so brave would dare to enter the battle and slay them. She said yes and got the necklace back. Under her spell, King Hogni and King Hathen battled for 143 years. As soon as they fell down, they had to stand up again and fight on. So what can we gather from this little tale that we have about Freya, which has been passed down to us through the sands of time and sadly through the lens of the celibate Christian monks who would later come to know her as the goddess of love and sexuality and say, oh, uh-uh, not gonna have any of that around here. And I think that's why a lot of these goddesses are so little mentioned and so lost to time is because they did not fit in with this larger Christian monotheistic one god patriarchal worldview where everything is ruled by men and therefore male divinities as well. So not only were these stories of women and goddesses just not important to the men who were examining these stories and determining what was important or worthy enough to be written down and passed on. They also probably left out a lot of what they did not find appealing or what did not fit in with their black versus white, good versus evil worldview. So we see this goddess of love and beauty basically being brought low having to humble herself. And as I go into parts two and three and delve deeper and deeper into these myths, I think this is partly a metaphor which is hidden within the tale and lost to time. It's one of the only things that we see mentioned about her time and again in the stories is that she's wearing Brisingamen. And so I think it must be significant somehow. Especially this part at the end, the final paragraph, where in exchange for getting the necklace back, Freya is ordered to make two kings served by many kings in turn, so this is a large number of men and large armies, fight forever. For 143 years, in fact, which seems like a lot longer than the normal mortal human lifespan to me for these two specific kings to be fighting. But not only that, 
that as soon as they fall down, they have to stand up again and fight on. And this sounds a lot like what we know of the warriors who are slain in battle and go to live in Odin's Hall of Valhalla. By day, you know, they go out and have to fight upon the field of battle, but as soon as they're slain, they kind of go back each night and get to feast and party, and it's just this endless cycle. And so I wonder if it's perhaps tied to that, because one of the other things we do know about Freya is that she gets first pick of the slain in battle, even ahead of Odin. And so I wonder if Odin is perhaps using this necklace of Brisingamen as some type of leverage over Freya to force these kings to fight forever. If so, if he can't control getting like the best pick of the fallen warriors, he will at least be able to coerce her into still fulfilling his means and ends and making all of these people fight so that he still will get a surplus of people to choose from. So maybe it's something like that. Maybe like, yeah, Odin is kind of sharing power with her as part of this bargain and it's his way to kind of gain back some kind of control in the situation. We can only wonder. I do find it interesting that in order to get this necklace of Brisingamen, Freya has to spend a night with these four dwarves these four artisans, these craftsmen, and not only that, in a way, as I alluded to in my videos about shadow work and these goddesses who undertake a journey to the underworld, this might be a deeper metaphor for Freya doing something like that in order to glean some kind of knowledge from these dwarves or for them to glean some kind of knowledge from her in exchange for this artifact. The Christianized version is kind of just portraying it as, oh Freya, she's just this typical woman who has this gold lust, this literal gold digger who will do anything for shiny baubles, including, as they would see it, debasing herself by lying with these non-divine beings, these vulgar dwarves, these dirty dwarves who live underneath the ground, and oh, why would she demean herself like that? But, you know, it doesn't hold up with Christian purity culture and their idea of this, you know, virgin goddess, you know, Mary and her virgin birth and things like that. Here we have this goddess who will just kind of sleep around in order to get a necklace. They're not gonna um, jive with that in the Christian worldview, so I think not only are we trying to get people to already look at these beings as not of divine origin at all by saying that she was in fact, just a human woman living in Asia, a concubine of Odin, but furthermore that, you know, not only is she not a goddess, she's not even, like, pure and virginal, you know? She's just, oh, the furthest thing from worth worshipping. And so I definitely think there's a little bit of that going on, a little bit of bias on their part and trying to kind of inject that subtly or not so subtly into the narrative, but maybe that's just my opinion and how I view it through a feminist lens, but I think think that there was definitely some type of angle going on back then and you definitely got to pick and choose the types of stories that they passed down to us and it definitely seems like just as often as we're getting stories of Thor and Odin and their great deeds like taking up the runes we're getting stories where they're making fart jokes or slutting it up in Asgard all the time trying to get people back then to convert to Christianity and see worshiping God as better and see him as this better more worthy being of worshiping by basically degrading and depicting the, these gods as lesser than. We want to find the stories where they're not making good choices, where they're making mistakes and poor decisions, where they're lying and being deceitful, where they're not holding with um, views of monogamous marriage and things like that. Like I know it even says that w one of the reasons for the Acer vayner War was that the Acer saw the Vayner were doing things like taboo incestuous practices with Frey and Freya. Oh my goodness, they just saw all the moral things going on over in Vanaheim and had to put a stop to it. I do think there is a little bit of that 
going on in these stories when they were being written down by the Christians later, but there are little kernels of truth and some deeper metaphors that we might be able to glean. And so I'm going to leave you with that version of the tale for now. And then in part two, I have another version of the story which I found in a book of fairy tales. And then in part three, I will give you my own personal UPG comparative mythology kind of deep dive version into what I think the true nature of Brisingamen is and the true story of how Freya came to get it. Stay tuned, I hope you enjoyed this, and until next time, stay classy, pagans!